uh, now, in November 2021, a remote controlled timber load was tested for the first time in Timrå. And now we're going to go back to Timrå in Torsboda and look how it looked like. För varje fordon eller fordonskombination i rörelse så finns det ett flertal lagar som man måste förhålla sig till. Det måste finnas en förare som i varje ögonblick har kontroll över fordonet. Men det finns ingenting som säger att föraren måste befinna sig i fordonet. I leave the word to you, Tanya. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Tanya Keiso, and I'm here from Biometria. What is Biometria? Maybe some of you are thinking. Let me give you a short brief. Biometria is a member-owned association operating in the forestry sector. We do impartial measurement and detailed reporting about the wood flows all around in Sweden. For an example, we communicate with over 3,000 forest machines every year. And in that communication, we handle detailed information of over 200 million trees being harvested. I am head of Biometra Labs, our department for innovation, where things like remote controlled vehicles makes us very curious. But how did we go from measurement of timber to join this project about remote controlled timber loaders. Biometria was inspired by the mining company Boliden back in 2018 when they, together with Volvo construction equipment, announced that they had developed a remote controlled wheel loader. That was at the same time as the forest forestry sector was in a big transformation regarding measurement of timber. Since the 70s, uh, timber have been measured on site at the industry. But a remote measurement method was developed and the measurement was, <laughs> was moved to remote centrals. There were several driving forces to this transformation, but mainly to lower cost and higher accessibility. Now, Five, seven years later, we can see that remote measurement shortens waiting times, enables longer opening hours, because different industries can share the same operators. We see that the truck fleet in the sector can be used more optimally. And Biometra have staffing 24-7 for measurement. And there is this vision in the industry to have a wood flow everywhere in Sweden 24-7. And remote measurement and remote unloading are linked. After measurement, we do the unloading. But we can't do things just for fun. There needs to be a business need. But before I pop into the business need of this project, I would like to share a uh, challenge we have in the forest industry with our raw material. material. As you know, Sweden is a large country with long distances and all raw material trees grow everywhere. Transportation can't be done only by timber trucks. For long distance, we need to use both railway and shipping by sea. But we don't have railways or seas out in every forest. <laughs> so the first part of the transp transportation is always made by timber trucks. And we have these timber terminals for temporary storage before the raw material is transported to uh, pulp mills, sawmills or heat plants. And that's why we have measurement sites in rural, rural areas. And in these areas, it can be a bit tricky to find workforce or offer accessibility at nights or weekends. So 
The business needs for this project is to reduce cost, higher accessibility, and of course the work environment. It is a lonely environment and also a bit dangerous with these big machines operating. Quite same business needs as we had for remote measurement. And that's not strange because the industry is the same. And the vision of a 24-7 wood flow is also the same. At Biometria Labs, we are curious to <laughs> look at the whole potential. What, is, what if every site that have remote measurement shared uh, one central for remote unloading? How many operators would be needed? So here is a random pick day. You can for every hour see how many loads are incoming. They will appear as green dots on the chart. And we have then done a simulation how many operators would be needed for that. And this is a very upspeeded video. You can see there is a peak in the morning, around lunchtime and in the afternoon. And it's a nice thought that an operati operator first could help someone up in the north of Sweden with unloading and in the next second help someone down in the south of Sweden. So there is a great potential, but I think it's time to dig even deeper into the technology tested and the results of this project. Thank you. All right. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Tanya. Uh, all right. So my name is uh, Christian Spjutare, and uh, I work as a program manager for uh, service solutions within construction equipment. Uh, and I will try to give you some background to how we work with this technology uh, and show you some of the equipment we have been using and what uh, we have been working on in the project. But let's start with some basics first. What is remote control? Uh, well, we actually distinguish between two different types. Uh, when we talk about remote control, we actually refer to the traditional way, like when you drive a remote control toy, you use some sort of control device to maneuver the machine while it's within line of sight. But the technology we are working on here, uh, we call tail operation. And this is when you use cameras on the machine to transmit the environment to the operator sitting in a control station, which can be located completely in, uh, independent of the machine. And of course, to do this, you need to combine a lot of different skills and know-how in areas such as communication, video processing, machine functionality, and not to forget uh, understanding the operator behavior. So why are we working with tail operation? Uh, well, as you saw before, Tanya mentioned some of the possibilities for using tail operation in the forest industry, and I will come back to that. Uh, but there are actually several other interesting use cases where the tail operation could improve our customers' business. Uh, and first, and perhaps the most obvious, is when a machine has to work in a hazardous environment. Uh, <clears throat> and you still uh, want to uh, you still want to keep up the production, but you want to move the operator away from danger. Uh, this can, for instance, be uh, on steep ledges where the machine is at risk of falling or where the ground could collapse. Another interesting use case where tail operation could increase the productivity is in mining, just as Tanya mentioned before as well. You can minimize the standstill after blasting in the mine. And instead of waiting for dust to settle and uh, to ventilate uh, toxic gases, you can move in and start working much sooner. And then tail operation can also be an enabler uh, for the transition towards autonomous operations. You can use it to aid in complex situations where the autonomous system is not yet fully capable of handling the situation and let autonomy handle the more repetitive work steps. <clears throat> so why did we decide to go into the forest industry then? Well, since we have been working with tail operation in a number of uh, projects over the last couple of years, 
uh, but in other applications, we we uh, said we needed to look into other uh, opportunities. Uh, but from an operator uh, perspective, we know that timber handling is a very difficult application to master. And if we could make tail operation work in this application, we could probably handle many other applications as well. Uh, and also this industry provided a new type of use case for us uh, where the machines on many remote sites could be controlled from one centralized tower. As Tanya also mentioned, uh, there is a shortage of skilled operators, which is of course then made even more difficult by the remoteness of many of the terminals. Uh, then tail operation could help the companies to find the right skills by locating the control center in a more attractive place. <clears throat> and in a nutshell, this means that tail operation could be an enabler to lower cost by co-locating the operations for uh, the terminals, uh, increasing the opening hours and providing cleaner, safer and more attractive work environments, of course. All right, so let's dig into the gear then. Well, first of all, when running a machine without an operator in the cab, it's of course extremely important to consider safety aspects. Uh, the major concern is to make sure that people can't enter into the working area unintentionally, believing that the machine is standing still because there is no operator in the cab. So this means that we need to use barriers to shield the machine uh, in the working area. Taking a look at the machine itself, uh, what we have been uh, using for the tests in this project is a wheel loader called L180H High Lift. Uh, this is a specialized machine for timber handling. Uh, it weighs roughly 38 tons. It can carry almost nine tons of timber in the grapple and it can place the timber in piles up to six meters high. Uh, and this machine was taken straight off the production line in our factory. Uh, and of course, that's where the fun started, getting all the gear in place and making it work together. So uh, the machine is a standard machine, which we uh, have equipped with an additional PC and 5G equipment to be able to transmit both the machine control signals, uh, but also the video streams from the cameras. Uh, the machine was then equipped with cameras to secure optimal visibility around the machine. The setup for this machine consists of 11 different cameras uh, mounted all over the machine to cover the important angles. Uh, and the number of cameras here also reflects the complexity of this application uh, because the for other applications we are uh, using around six or seven cameras generally. So if you have ever been in one of these machines, you know that visibility around the machine is quite tricky. There are a lot of things blocking clear sight, both forward where you have the lifting framework, you have the protective grill over the windshield, backwards where you have the long engine compartment with exhaust pipes, fire extinguishing uh, equipment, and also down on the sides. It can be very tricky to see the ground close to the machine. So let's have a look at how we can improve the operator environment. Looking at the control rig, uh, it consists of a standard Volvo training simulator, which provides a comfortable working position and the same type of controls that you find in the standard machine. And in front of that, we have placed five large screen monitors where we dynamically can change view positions, uh, information presented to uh, the operator and so on. And in this case, we had a mix of the video, video streams and graphical representations like machine angle, uh, distance to objects, uh, rev counter, etc. <clears throat> and as we mentioned before, visibility can be a struggle in the machine, but one of the great advantages of tail operation is that you have the possibility to significantly improve visibility for the operator. And by placing the, the cameras in the right spots on the machine, the operator can have all the information right in front of him and no need to turn the head, look at the sides or to the back. Everything can be captured uh, in one glance. 
there is, however, an important aspect to consider there that the, opera uh, the operator must not be overloaded with information because even if the information is there on the screen, it might not be noticed if there is too much uh, going on attracting the attention. And to secure the best camera placements and uh, of course also capture all the needed information for the operator, we performed a visibility analysis and later during the development we also had two sessions where the uh, operators that would participate in the demo uh, <clears throat> tested the machines and gave us feedback in an early stage uh, which resulted in a lot of changes to both the camera positions and the view placements on the screen. All right, so what input did we get from the operator then? Uh, during the demo week, there were a lot of people visiting and we got many thoughts and ideas from them. Uh, many of the reflections we hear from almost everyone testing tail operation for the first time, like I miss the sound. Uh, they want to hear the engine revving, uh, the hydraulics working to understand how the machine is working. I feel dizzy is quite common as well. Uh, I miss the sense of depth as well. Uh, since it's a screen and not a 3D environment. Uh, and it's important to highlight that many of these comments actually change as the operator gets used to driving. And some can actually be trained away with more practice. A really important comment was that this actually makes the work accessible for people with physical challenges, uh, which was uh, an, an actual case in one of the sister terminals here. Uh, and one common input from experienced drivers is that they want the screen view to be exactly the same as the one they are used to from uh, driving the machine. And in this case, despite the protective grille over the window, which is actually blocking much of the visibility, the operator still wants the same view. And the reason is that he uses the protective grille and the lifting framework as references and he knows angles and distances related to it when he operates the machine. So during the course of the week, we actually saw that this changed and the views that they used the most were not the same uh, in the beginning of the week as it was uh, at the end of the week. And this really shows how important it is to give the operators time to learn how to run the machines tail operated. It's almost like learning a completely new machine. Also, the first few days improves the driving performance dramatically. And we saw that uh, the operators with fewer hours in this type of machine had a lot easier to adapt and learn to, to drive this machine, uh, tail operated them. Uh, so to sum up, uh, we got a lot of useful information and feedback from these tests. But to be able to realize a tail operation solution like this, we also need dependable communications and robust uh, communication and data transfer. So over to you, Matthias. Yes. Uh, then I will go into some of the uh, results and insights that we got from this project and also some specific results from uh, the evaluation of using 5G for, for this application, which was uh, one important part in this. So if we look at the test site, uh, we simplified the problem quite a lot. <laughs> uh, so we had one area here, uh, 200 times 50 meters, that was the test area, where we had uh, specific 5G base station installed uh, with line of sight for the full area. Uh, and when you set this in perspective for the full timber terminal, uh, it's quite limited. So the full problem is a bit bigger. Uh, another challenge is, uh, which I'll come back to, that uh, these timber bundles are quite high, quite narrow, uh, and are 
the timber is excellent damping of radio signals. So this is a challenge that uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, the setup for the communication is that the machine was connected with a 5G connection and the 5G connection was installed just for this test so it was uh, line of sight and very close to, to the machine. Uh, then a fiber connection uh, down to Stockholm and fiber connection back from Stockholm to Timrå uh, to the control station where the driver was sitting. So the driver really was sitting here, uh, not seeing the, the machine, but for simplicity of the test, uh, this was uh, uh, quite important, I think. But the test shows that the, the data traffic moved uh, back and forth to Stockholm, so basically it, it could be anywhere in Sweden. Uh, one of the main insights in this was that uh, the communication, the 5G connection, uh, it's quite sensitive when it comes to line of sight, especially when the, you have these uh, timber bundles. Uh, and uh, we had these uh, requirements around uh, 50 megabits per second that uh, the application needed and also end-to-end uh, -end latency of uh, 200 milliseconds. And what we see saw that uh, when we didn't have actual line of sight, we didn't fulfill the requirements uh, totally. So that's a challenge that needs to be addressed uh, to make this working, that you, for the full timber terminal, uh, you have line of sight the connection with the 5G connect connectivity. Uh, other conclusions, because apart from uh, what uh, Christian was showing with the setting up the, the machine uh, to be teleoperated, which is the key, key, perhaps the key thing in this to, to demonstrate, uh, the other part uh, is to show or investigate from this test compared to with manned machines is there a possible savings? Is there a business for this? This was one of the key questions in the project. And from the test uh, where we have measured uh, man operated with the man inside the ca cab uh, and also the teleoperated, is that uh, with the savings you can do with teleoperation, uh, there is a potential for efficient improvement of 35% during day and 48% during night. Uh, under one assumption that uh, some of the issues uh, in performance uh, can be solved. Uh, that is, we saw in the, the timing of uh, certain parts, uh, mainly of the grabbing and release of the timber. Uh, that took a bit too long to make this uh, economically functioning. But we s the conclusion is that with more training probably that could be solved and also with automation it also can be solved. Uh, we also had an activity looking at the legal aspect of this and uh, the main conclusion is that there is not really any legal issues to prevent this from happening. Uh, one needs to ensure that uh, this it's cyber secure, uh, it's physically secure, uh, that we don't hurt people, so basically that we need to create an autonomous operating zone. The communication uh, line of sight is needed to get good enough connection in this uh, hard environment. Uh, another thing which I don't think we really tested is to get the full end-to-end -end quality. I think we had 
perhaps too good connection in the backbone uh, to really test this but uh, to get to a public network where we could have a lot of other traffic there is also need to look at uh, how to ensure the end-to-end -end quality in the communication uh, oops. As Christian was said, uh, the drivers at the end of the week got really good performance, apart from some parts of their work. Uh, they expressed some need from haptic feedback to feel the movement of the machine and also sound. Uh, but also in the analysis we have made, it's that uh, automation of, of these key tasks could solve a lot of these performance issues that we saw. So in the next step uh, we will look at, so here we see the machine uh, unloading uh, into a train cart or simulated train cart. Uh, so this was one of the tasks that took quite some a uh, lot more time to perform than the uh, man uh, equipped uh, machine did but here we have looked in that uh, this could be automated and uh, the other part that we will continue to look at uh, where we have formulated the project is to look at the planning and distribution of um, the 5G connection to really ensure that this is uh, in high quality and line of sight and then also look at the uh, the backbone network uh, to get an uh, yeah ensure the quality of the communication channel end to end and get uh, the technology in place for that and also look at the uh, edge computing technology for trying to see what parts uh, can be handled in the edge so we get better performance. And the other part that we will also look into is automation of these critical tasks. Because if these two parts are, are solved, uh, I think it's uh, then most of the challenges are solved to get this to happen someday. And this is the uh, people involved in the test. Uh, we had uh, Telia that provided the 5G connection, uh, Skogforsk and Biometria that did the, uh, the analysis together with SAE, uh, looked at the, uh, the business models for this. Uh, and Volvo that uh, equipped and uh, manned the machine and we that looked at the, the 5G connection and the future perspective of this. So, this was uh, the remote timber project. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions here on Menti. Uh, maybe we can connect Christian also to the room so we can ask him a question. Sure. Welcome. Yes, <laughs> we see you. Okay, uh, I take them one by one. Uh, the first one, uh, do you know if there is a ga gas sensor to detect leakage of oil around the machine in the working environment? Is that for you, Christian? Yeah, that's actually one of the uh, good uh, and interesting topics we need to solve to take this further and uh, putting it in a more large scale uh, scenario because uh, <coughs> The sense of sound is one thing, the sense of smell is another thing that you commonly use when you operate these types of machines. So at this moment we don't have it, but that, uh, that is something we are looking into for sure. Yes. And we also get some questions here about uh, VR and uh, VR glasses and display and 360 view camera investigated. Was that investigated as a potential solution and what was the reason not using VR? 
Uh, <clears throat> basically, we have tested a lot of these uh, different options. Uh, we have tested uh, uh, VR, we have tested um, like dome displays uh, and so on. But we uh, we have basically said that VR uh, in this setting is uh, kind of complex and it gives even more the feeling of being dizzy and getting a little bit nauseated by, uh, by driving the machine. Uh, since you are disconnected from the movement uh, of the machine. So uh, in, in this project, we chose to not use that. And also for uh, for the dome display and so on, we, we chose not to use that uh, due to uh, the lighting conditions. Thank you. I will ask the questions and anyone who feels ready to answer it, raise their hand. <laughs> uh, so what uh, is the acceptable range for delay that you can uh, call the remote control is real time remote controlling? I guess that's one for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we have made uh, many tests on this, and uh, as I think uh, Matthias mentioned here before, a 200 millisecond delay um, is the, the, the limit that we set end to end from that you move the uh, the control in in the rig uh, to that you see the motion uh, happening on the machine. So um, end to end, and that includes, of course, then um, also machine delays and so on. I think this is in the same area. What's the latency, including machine control system and human delay? If not, what was the total delay? Uh, we, we don't. Uh, we haven't measured the actual delay uh, uh, in this system. Well, we saw that uh, in in the communications uh, uh, link, we could see that the delay was around twenty to thirty milliseconds, uh, something like that. Uh, the other ones we haven't measured. Yeah, I go on here. Is it possible to use the this remote tech for say forklifts in shipping docks? I would say this type of technology would be uh, usable uh, for basically any type of machine that you uh, that you have. Uh, I'm not sure who mentioned the security barriers. Do you do they have to be a physical or have you looked into virtual barriers, person detection? And those were some of the conclusions we did in the project that that is uh, of course uh, a feasible solution as well uh, for this project we said that uh, the most important thing is keeping people out of the demo uh, area and also that we we weren't putting the the highest focus on uh, developing those solutions we were developing the the tail operation system but going forward in this we of course need to consider those systems and and developing those as well but i mean geofencing and uh, <clears throat> and uh, people detection and so on is of course one of the interesting uh, things to look uh, further into now i hope there's a question for uh, <laughs> tanya or uh, matthias here. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> it's another one. How far away is automation of all the different tasks like uh, grip, grab, unload? Is that Matthias? I, I think as, uh, as Matthias mentioned here, we uh, we see that there are different areas of the, the work tasks um, that could benefit from being automated. Uh, definitely. Uh, and I mean, how far away is, is the automation of the complete one? It's difficult to say. Uh, we cannot really answer that now, but we have identified good steps to uh, to develop this application further, at least. And what also that we discussed is that the, uh, the automation could also benefit where you have a person in the cab, N not only the teleoperator that you you can improve the the quality uh, the work quality uh, even if the person is sitting there to get these functions there and i think one of the keys that we uh, mentioned here also was that 
using tail operation will be an enabler to actually get automation into the process, which will also speed up the development of that. So uh, then you can handle the complex uh, maneuvers with uh, uh, the people uh, tail operated, and then you can leave the the either semi-automated support to automation, but also uh, the uh, the the bulk of uh, yeah mono monotonous work, for instance. So, when can we see this uh, remote control loading uh, in reality, Tanya? Do you have any guess? <laughs> well, uh, I think we first need a couple of years of more uh, research uh, to look even deep, uh, deeper into the things that Matthias highlighted. But uh, uh, I think there was there will be an interesting race to be the first one with this technology uh, on site. And uh, that's not that quite long uh, in the future, I think. Five years, maybe. <laughs> but then we have this perspective that going from measurement on site to remote measurement took 50 years. So, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully faster than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have one more for Christian. What have you at Volvo learned during this project? Well... I mean, we have so many learnings from this. Uh, I think one of the, the really important things to, uh, to mention is the collaboration uh, with the other partners of this project, which has been, at least from my perspective, a great success, combining the competence from the different parts of the industry and the value chain with the academic research. And I think this is a really good way for uh, all companies to work to explore future business and technology potentials. So, that's one of the key uh, key takeaways for me personally. Yeah, and Matthias. Uh, can I just agree that uh, the uh, the collaboration in this project has been really excellent, and every partner has have a really important task to fulfill uh, to make this project successful, and uh, a good project leader in Anna Maria. <laughs> Okay, I don't have any more questions now on Mente, I guess. If somebody wants to ask a question here on site, yeah? yeah. You can use my microphone. <laughs> uh, <coughs> you talk about the different technique like a 5G and age you are going to use in the field. I am wondering uh, if you, uh, for as I know, 5G cell can cover uh, 100 meter. So in the industrial field, for cover and long area, you need more than one uh, point site for cover and long range. So if you uh, miss the connection between the site and the uh, machine, in, uh, till example, in the machine located in the bad handover uh, coverage or fading, or something like this, you uh, missing the line of sight between the machine and the sector, what will happen? And the, or if you miss the, if you have an outage between the sector, uh, between the uh, base controller of the door site and the Stockholm, there, as you said, it's a fiber. If you have a ma outage in the fiber connection, what will happen? And uh, how you, how you, calculate the delay of this fiber because it different t uh, time it's because of the uh, workload we have different delay so it those things is so important missing connection between the operator till machine how you solve this i mean i think uh, for the robustness of the end to end communication i I mean, that's what we're trying to address in the next project, that this is really important. But, uh, when it comes to the 5G connection, I would say, I mean, it depends on what 5G and what frequencies you use. You can get more than 100 meters. Uh, that's no problem. But uh, what we learn here is that you need to plan the deployment of the 5G network on site quite well. And also uh, we will investigate ways of uh, yeah get improving that connectivity uh, with uh, yeah 
masts or if it's uh, drones to, to help the connectivity there. I can comment from a machine level that we have we have included a safety function related to that to uh, make sure that if we have a too long delay in uh, uh, the communication, so we have a communication break, uh, then we uh, have an emergency stop on the machine. Yeah, we got one more question. Yeah, just related to that then, uh, how do you control the delay uh, of the video? How do you know that the picture the operator sees is actually the picture that the camera is uh, taking for that moment? That is also one of the things that we have incorporated with uh, the, the sync here between uh, <coughs> the video and, uh, and the control signal so that we, we have a, a continuous check of that to make sure that there, there is a sync and if, if we don't have the sync then we, uh, we also have put an emergency stop to the operations. Yeah, I think there are no further questions then. No? So thank you very much, speakers and the audience. Thank you. Thank you.